When you're in an elevator, can you tell that you're moving? When can you feel that most strongly? At the beginning maybe, at the end, in the middle somewhere? And what happens if you kick a bowling ball, other than hurting your toe? Is it easier to kick a bowling ball or a tennis ball? If you kick a bowling ball and a tennis ball with the same force, which one will accelerate the most? Spoiler alert, the answer to these questions involves forces. Surprised? Welcome to Flip Physics. Today we're going to talk about Newton's second law and apply that to elevators, or lifts if you speak real English. Newton's second law can be represented with an equation, f equals ma. You might see this written as f net equals ma. You might see it written as the sum of the forces equals ma. You might see it written just as f equals ma. You might hear it described as the overall force equals ma. This force is the unbalanced force. It's whatever's left after you've cancelled out any pushes against each other. And this force, this overall net force on an object, is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by the acceleration that object will feel because of that net force. It's like if two people are pushing on a block equally, it's not going to accelerate. It's not going to start moving in any direction. It's not going to speed up. It's not going to slow down because the net force is zero. Everything's cancelled out. But if one person pushes harder, then it is going to accelerate. And remember, accelerate means speed up or slow down. It doesn't mean move. A constantly moving object actually has a net force of zero too. So for example, if you slam the accelerator down on your car, you speed up because the driving force of the car is stronger than the force of friction holding it back. So there is a net force overall and that will lead to an acceleration. If you let go of the gas pedal, then the frictional force is greater than the driving force. So the car will slow down and eventually stop. Or in other words, when you let go of the pedal, there is a net force opposite to the direction the car is moving and that means there is an acceleration pointed opposite to the direction the car is moving. The other thing that Newton's second law tells us is that if we double the mass of the object, it will take double the force to get a particular acceleration. So this is like the bowling ball versus the tennis ball. The bowling ball has a bigger mass, and that means it takes more force to accelerate it. So if you kick a bowling ball and a tennis ball with exactly the same force, the bowling ball will not accelerate as much as the tennis ball. If the bowling ball was double the mass of a tennis ball, obviously it's a lot more than that, but if it was double the mass of a tennis ball, then it would take double the force to accelerate it by the same degree. So, for the car we could write the sum of the forces equals ma. This will be exactly the same as writing f net equals ma. It's just another way of writing the same thing. But then we have to replace the f part with the forces that are actually acting in this particular situation. This f is a general term for the overall force in a situation. And these forces are the driving force, fd, and the frictional force, ff. The minus sign tells us that the frictional force is going in the opposite direction. So let's say the car is moving this way. This way will be the positive direction, and that way will be the negative direction. The driving force is going in the positive direction, the frictional force holding it back is going opposite to that in the negative direction. It doesn't actually matter which direction you call positive and negative, as long as you keep everything consistent. And that includes the acceleration. Acceleration is a vector quantity too. So if you were plugging numbers into this equation, you would need to make sure that when you put the acceleration in, you used the correct sign, positive or negative. So if this car is speeding up, the driving force being bigger than the frictional force, the car is accelerating in this direction, the positive direction. So when you put a number into the equation, you'd have to make sure that your value of A was positive. Whereas if the car was slowing down, it's going this way, but the car's slowing, then there's a bigger frictional force that way. So the acceleration is that way. Whatever direction the net force, the overall total force acts, is the same direction that the acceleration acts. That's because these are vector quantities. But just for reference, when we're drawing diagrams in this physics class, we're going to always say that to your right is positive, to your left is negative. In the vertical direction, we're going to say that up is positive and down is negative. That's just to keep things straight. We want to keep everything nice and clear. But if you choose to reverse it, if you get the right answer, it's not a problem. But just be careful. So in this case, with this diagram, the driving force is to the right and the frictional force is to the left. That's why the driving force is positive and the frictional force is negative. It also means that if we were using this equation to find the acceleration, then our final value for A should come out as positive because this car is accelerating in the positive direction. 
But let's go back to the elevators. When you're in an elevator, like pretty much all other situations, you feel when your body accelerates. And that happens when the elevator speeds up at the start, when it just starts moving, and when it slows down at the end, when it just reaches a stop. In between, if you're moving at a perfect constant speed, you can't tell that you're moving at all. That's the same reason that we can't tell that we're zooming around the sun right now. Now, if we apply Newton's laws to this situation, that means that in the middle part, when it's moving at a constant speed, the forces must be balanced. There are two forces acting, gravity pulling you down, and there's the normal force of the floor pushing on you, acting up. If you're being pushed up by the elevator, the floor is the thing that's pushing you up. So we could write a balanced forces equation just like we did in a previous video. Fg is equal to Fn. But today we're talking about Newton's second law, which is for objects that are accelerating. So let's just look at the times when the elevator is accelerating, the start and the end. So let's say you're stood in an elevator and it starts to move upwards. For that first little jolt when you start moving, the forces would look like this. The normal force is stronger than the force of gravity. Then the forces will be balanced while you move up at a constant speed. And then finally, when you come to a stop, the forces would look like this. Now, the force of gravity is stronger than the normal force. And this is, of course, all determined by what the elevator actually does. Notice that gravity never changes in strength. The Earth always pulls on you with the same force. But the elevator changes its motion in order to change the normal force that acts on you. Or if you are accelerating down in Tower of Terror, the force of gravity will be greater than the normal force acting up. Of course, if you're falling to your death in Tower of Terror, then you're accelerating all the way down and even more when you hit the floor. But I digress. So the first step in analyzing any situation is drawing a free body force diagram. So this was the diagram for when the elevator is starting to move upwards. Next, because the forces are unbalanced, we can write a Newton's second law equation. Newton's law says the net force, the overall force, the sum of the forces, whatever you want to call it, is equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration. And in this case, these are the two forces that are acting. We have the normal force acting up, and the force of gravity acting down. At this time, the normal force is greater than the force of gravity, so this is gonna come out as a positive number, which means a positive acceleration. You're accelerating up. That makes sense. Remember that we always have to replace the sum of the forces with the specific forces that are acting in a situation. We can't just ever leave it on its own. Unless we were, say, asked for the net force, which is really unusual, we wouldn't ever normally leave that alone. And just a reminder, Fn is acting up, so it's positive, and Fg is negative because it's acting down. And that's equal to your mass multiplied by your acceleration during that little jolt. And we can replace Fg, the force of gravity, with Mg, because force of gravity is equal to mass times the acceleration due to gravity g. So let's say you weigh 70 kilograms, and let's say you're on a human elevator, you haven't been abducted by aliens. So being on Earth, g is equal to 9.8 as usual. And let's say you're told that the normal force acting on you during the jolt is 800 newtons. And the question says, at what rate are you accelerating? Or maybe it says, what is your acceleration? All we need to do is some algebra to solve for a. Divide both sides by 70 and we'll make a the subject of the equation. Type all of this stuff into a calculator and this is what we get. Side note, if you were paying really close attention, you might have noticed that I used 9.8 as the acceleration. I didn't use negative 9.8, even though the acceleration due to gravity is pointed down. There is a reason for that. By having this negative sign here, what I'm saying is that this force is acting down. I've already pointed the force down, so I don't need an extra negative sign in there. There's still one last piece of information you need about elevator problems. In that last question, we were told that the normal force acting on you is 800 newtons. But how could you calculate that in real life? Well, one way to do that is to use a bathroom scale. Because of the way the bathroom scale works, it doesn't really measure the force of gravity pulling you down. It's more like it measures the normal force pushing you up. It's just that in most situations, like when you just stood in your bathroom, those two forces just happen to be equal to each other. So the scale really measures your normal force. But when you're speeding up and slowing down in an elevator, your normal force is changing. So if you had a scale that was calibrated to tell you your force in newtons, instead of having a reading in kilograms or pounds, you could use that to figure out the normal force. You just have to take your scale in your elevator, stand on it, and watch the scale as you accelerate as the elevator starts to move. And that would tell you the normal force acting on you. A little bit of extension information. Now technically, you probably don't have a scale that measures in newtons. Yours probably measures in pounds or kilograms. If you have one that has kilograms on it, you can still use it. Remember that the force of gravity in newtons is equal to the mass in kilograms multiplied by g, the acceleration due to gravity. Now you know g is 9.8 on Earth. What you can do is take your readings in kilograms using a nor normal bathroom scale that has kilograms, and you can just multiply it by 9.8, multiply it by g, and that will give you the force of gravity in newtons. You're essentially just converting kilograms into newtons. But do be careful about what this means. Say if you were speeding up in the elevator, the normal force is bigger than the force of gravity acting down. 
So if you do this, say if you weigh, normally weigh 70 kilograms, and you do that and you find that you weigh 80 kilograms, that doesn't mean that your weight has suddenly changed. It doesn't mean that the force of gravity is suddenly pulling you down more. The force of gravity acting on you is exactly the same as it was before, and your mass is exactly the same as it was before. The scale only really represents the normal force. What it's telling you is that the normal force is roughly 800 newtons, which is the same normal force that you would have if a person wasn't on an elevator and happened to weigh 80 kilograms. That's all it's saying. And thanks to this video, you'll never look at Tower of Terror the same way again. You're welcome. Thanks for watching Flip Physics. Please feel free to like and subscribe or go to the flipphysics.net website. But most of all, make sure you leave a comment below with your questions, thoughts, and suggestions. Until next time, keep questioning. DFTBA. It is awesome to question. DFTBQ. Don't forget to be a questioner.